Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Maudsley. I am the Science Advisor at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, which is a joint presentation between the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and U.S. Forest Service Research and Development. We have a great presentation today from Dr. Sam Cushman, who is a research ecologist at the Rocky Mountain Research Station, U.S. Forest Service Research and Development, on the subject of using landscape analyses to examine population distribution, abundance, and genetic diversity of focal species. Before we get started with today's presentation, just a few housekeeping details. First, today's webinar is being recorded, so if you want to review the material or share it with colleagues, it will become available shortly after the, uh, the conclusion of today's webinar on AFWA's YouTube channel. So if you go to Google and type in AFWA, that's A-F-W-A, and YouTube, our channel will come up, and there's actually a space where you can find this webinar and other webinars in the same series. This webinar is part of a series of webinars sponsored by U.S. Forest Service and the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. We'll have another webinar next month on another topic of interest to state fish and wildlife agencies. Uh, during the course of today's webinar, we ask that you use your mute fun function on your own phone or on your screen to mute your own line so that we don't get extraneous background noise during the course of the presentation. If necessary, I can mute all the lines and bring the speaker up, but I know we're going to have a couple of other folks sharing during the middle of today's presentation. So if possible, let's all mute our lines so that we don't get extraneous background noise. And then while the lines are muted, there is a comment box function which should be in the lower left-hand portion of your screen where you can provide comments and questions for the speaker. Depending on the time remaining at the end of today's presentation, we may be able to have time for some questions and answers. We'll go to the questions first that are in the comment box. I'll read those and the speaker will have a chance to respond to those. So as the presentation goes along, no need to hold your questions. Type them into the comment box and we'll get to them at the end. If time permits, we'll go into a more traditional Q&A format, but I do want to be respectful of people's time and try to keep this to an hour if possible. So with that, I'd like to uh, very much uh, thank our partners at the U.S. Forest Service Research and Development for all of their help in, in finding wonderful speakers for our webinar series. Thank them, uh, Dr. Sam Cushman in particular, for today's presentation, and our good friends and colleagues, Monica Thomasy and Dr. John Roethlisberger at U.S. Forest Service Research and Development for all of their work in making this webinar series possible. At this point, I'd like to turn the, the uh, speaking over to Dr. John Roethlisberger at U.S. Forest Service Research and Development, who will introduce today's speaker. John. Thanks, Jonathan, and hello, everyone. My name is John Roethlisberger. I'm the National Program Leader for Fish and Aquatic Ecology Research for uh, Forest Service Research and Development. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to partner with AFWA uh, for this webinar series. Uh, through this, this series, we're hoping to find ways to uh, effectively share information about progress on current Forest Service Fish and Wildlife Research, uh, to report on uh, recent research findings, and also to share synthesis of uh, scientific findings broadly related to natural resource management challenges. Uh, so as Jonathan said, our speaker today is Dr. Sam Cushman. I'd like to share uh, just a few brief introductory remarks uh, about Dr. Cushman. Uh, he is the director of the Center for Landscape Science in the Forest Service's Rocky Mountain Research Station. Uh, he's stationed in Flagstaff, Arizona and uh, he's also an adjunct professor at Northern Arizona University, as well as an affiliate faculty member uh, at Oregon State University. Uh, he currently serves as an editor for multiple scientific journals, including the Journal of Biodiversity and Conservation and the Journal of Landscape Ecology. Uh, Dr. Cushman's research includes developing statistics and software to analyze landscape patterns, uh, and plant and animal community characteristics along biophysical gradients. Uh, he also investigates the effects of management, fire, climate regi regimes, and ecological, uh, on ecological pattern and process at landscape scale levels. And he's going to talk to us about some of those topics today. 
Uh, Dr. Cushman's research takes him all over the world, and he has students and collaborators in many countries. Today, he is joining us from Oxford, England. Uh, he recently traveled there to work on a project with colleagues at Oxford University, so we appreciate him uh, taking some time out of uh, what is fairly late in the evening where he is right now to talk to us. So, uh, Dr. Cushman, thanks for joining us today, and I will turn the time over to you. All right, thank you very much. I'm really uh, delighted to be able to join you and, and present a topic that's near and dear to my health. Uh, heart, heart, which is using landscape analysis to examine population dynamics, patterns of abundance, genetic diversity of focal species. Uh, I'd like to recognize my co-author listed here, Aaron Langeth, who is a director of the Computational Ecology Laboratory at the University of Montana. Uh, she was a formal, former PhD student of mine, and she was the primary developer of the CDPOP tool that I'm going to be uh, focusing this talk on. So next slide, please. So yes, yeah, Center for Landscape Science is a Rocky Mountain Research Station Center of Excellence. And next slide, please. Somehow I just lost my screen. There it is. Um, and uh, we focus on a number of topics. We are uh, emphasizing development, synthesizing and delivering landscape knowledge uh, monitoring genetics, ecology, disturbance regimes, interacting with climate change, and adaptive management. So next slide, please. So today, I'm going to be talking about a particularly urgent management need, which is to understand and predict effects of land use change and wildlife populations. As you all are well aware, there are a number of species at risk uh, in the United States and, of course, internationally, many more. Uh, so there's a huge need for understanding uh, population dynamics and genetic diversity and things that affect them. So most agencies have relatively local or small-scale data uh, that's quite um, useful, but it's difficult to turn these kind of data sets into population-wide inferences and even more difficult to evaluate scenarios of the future, right? what landscape changes in the future um, will mean for populations and their genetic structure. Uh, so the next slide is uh, tools to address this. Uh, simulation models are particularly useful. Uh, in particular, spatially explicit, individual-based population and genetic simulation modeling is important. So spatially explicit means to keep track of uh, locations and the population process is affected by the spatial location and the structure of the environment. Individual based means we track individuals and, and individual behavior. And those two attributes are important for realistic simulations in the real world environment, which is uh, spatially heterogeneous. And so what we can do with these kinds of models is predict the effects of uh, landscape patterns and land use change on population size, density, distribution, gene flow, and diversity and adaptive potential and adaptive change. So that's uh, some of the advantages of these types of tools, and I'm going to give you an example of one that we've developed and its applications. So the next slide, please. So the simulation model, here's a picture of Aaron Langeth at the top with the dog. We developed this model called CDPOC, which means short for Cost Distance Population Simulator. And it's a spatially explicit individual-based population dynamics and genetics model. Uh, it simulates dispersal, mating, reproduction, mortality patterns uh, across a complex landscape. It uses resistance surfaces uh, to predict patterns of dispersal and patterns of mating, and fitness surfaces to look at differential patterns of mortality as a function of the landscape situation. And we can simulate changes in the population distribution and density and the genetic structure through time. Um, next slide. And so it works on a resistance surface. Here is an example of one. Blue colors are low resistance, red colors are high resistance. This reflects the landscape pattern of the suitability or the ease of moving through this landscape for an animal. This is a model for black bears in northern Idaho. Um, but this is the basis of the model. It is a spatially explicit model where mating and dispersal and mortality 
risk are all a function of cost between individuals. And this cost surface here is how it is parameterized. So the next slide will show you how. So here's a cost surface. Blue would be low cost, red is high cost. Here are a bunch of points on this that represent the potential places an animal might live. And the paths in between them are the least cost paths. And you can make a matrix, so as you see in the left corner, of the cost distance between these points. And the model uses that cost distance matrix to determine the likely locations an individual at any place in the landscape will disperse to and also the likely individuals the individual will mate with. You're more likely to mate and disperse to places that are nearby in the cost distance um, matrix than those that are far away across a barrier or at a great geographical distance. So it's, it's realistic in a sense that you can use the actual pattern of the landscape to uh, determine the, the demographic and dispersal dynamics of the population and parameterize it in a biologically reasonable and uh, realistic way. Next slide, please. So application. So I'm going to have two people give a quick brief description of how they are using or will use this modeling approach. And then I'm going to give you some other examples uh, in following slides. First, I'm going to let Zaneta Casta introduce her work here at the University of Oxford that uses CD Pop, and then I'm going to hand over to Michael Lucid at Idaho Fish and Game. So first, Zanetta. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Zanetta Casta. I work at um, Wildlife Conservation, Conservation Research Unit at the University of Oxford, and I uh, used CD Pop um, to analyze influence of development and rest restoration scenarios in Saba on uh, clouded leopard population density. Um, that's a um, case study in, in Borneo. Uh, so we use CD-POP um, to investigate uh, the influence on each of the developments on population, clouded leopard population size in 200 generations, um, allelic ri richness, um, and heterozygosity, uh, so that we can compare which um, of the developments influences the population the most, and we can quantify it, and we can also um, investigate it spatially, so see which um, areas of, of Borneo, of Saba, um, were influenced the most by the by certain development. Um, yes, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zanetta. Um, is Michael on the phone? I am. I'm here. All right, so Michael, we take a couple minutes to give a background on your project and talk about some things we might do with this as well. All right, fantastic. Hey, so I've got a cold today, everybody, so apologies for my voice. And if I, if I launch into any in con uncontrolled coughing fits, that's why. Um, yeah, so I've known Sam for a number of years, about 15 years, and we've worked together on a lot of different projects. And just by way of introduction, I'm a, I'm a regional biologist for Idaho Fish and Games uh, Wildlife Diversity Program. Um, so the most recent project uh, Sam and I have worked on is a project I led called the Multi-Species Baseline Initiative. And this was largely funded by a competitive state wildlife grant. And this project, uh, the field work for this project ran from 2010 to 2014. And the focus of the project was to, uh, was to uh, collect occurrence data over a large landscape, about 20,000 a kilometer squared for 19 species of greatest conservation need, which were listed as lacking essential information in um, Idaho's 2005 State Wildlife Action Plan. And so we did these surveys, and, uh, and we took a multi-species approach, so we were able to collect uh, occurrence data for 182 species at about 2,300 different sites across our study area, which was the Idaho Panhandle and adjoining mountain ranges in Montana, Washington, and British Columbia. And what this did was it changed our understanding of, of landscape level species occurrence. Um, if you think about the NatureServe S ranks, which as most people know, go from one to five. We, of our 19 target species, we increased those S ranks just because we increased knowledge of the species uh, by an average of 1.4. In the invertebrates in our work, uh, we increased the state ranks from uh, an average of 2.3. And only eight of our 19 species uh, from 2000 that were listed as SGCN species of greatest conservation need in 2005 actually remained uh, as 
SDCN than the 2015 spot. And uh, a lot of that was largely due to our surveys of terrestrial gastropods, amphibians, and forest carnivores, which really influenced uh, um, the 2015 swap. Um, so landscape occurrence is one thing, and landscape genetics is something else. And through our project, we didn't just collect occurrence data, we collected uh, DNA samples from many of the species that we surveyed. And uh, landscape genetics is really important because it, understand, it helps us understand how populations are, one, genetically communicating with, with each other and assess the genetic health and longevity and long-term viability of those populations. And this is really where SAM and CDPOP and some of the other tools he's developed really come in. Um, and I'll give you an example from Idaho's State Wildlife Action Plan of, of where we're going with this. Uh, so uh, our 2015 State Wildlife Action Plan is, is really riddled with a, a bunch of different gene objectives that uh, we can really only answer with, with genetic applications. And where I work in the Idaho Panhandle, which is along the Canadian border, there's an ecological section that we call the Okanagan Highlands. And our, one of our target uh, conservation targets is an ecosystem called the Forest of Lowland. And our highest rated threat, uh, we rated as a very high threat to that, to that particular uh, target, and it applies to the mountain ranges that, su that surround it, is the loss of genetic connectivity of 15 species of greatest conservation needs. And our conservation objective is to assess, restore, and monitor genetic connectivity between those mountain ranges. And it's interesting that Sam put up the black bear example because that's ex actually the, the ecological section that, um, he, that, that we are referring to. And so basically what we're going to do is use CDPOP and some other tools that Sam has developed to help us reach those objectives of assessing, restoring, and monitoring genetic connectivity between the mountain ranges. Um, and CDPOP's a really cool tool for, for a lot of different reasons. One thing I really like is that it allows us to include different biological traits for different species. And most of the papers that have come out from it, they, we don't know the biological traits for a lot of species, but because of MBI, we, we're starting to understand the biological traits for some of the species in, in our system. And, uh, and one in particular that I like is that uh, you can uh, assign the reproductive, uh, the reproductive uh, status of, of whatever species you're working with. And uh, for us, with gastropods, slugs, and snails, those are, uh, they're, they're, they re reproduce both sexually and asexually. So you can actually use that as a variable in the model. But I think one of the most important advantages of CDPOP is that it's an individual, not population-based based uh, base tool. And so that means for, for us as state, state wildlife people, we're really focused on species of greatest conservation need, which are usually rare, and it's hard to get big samples from them. So it's a tool that we can use for these rare species um, because we can use individuals instead of having to have big population data sets. Um, and uh, and with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Sam. And I guess the one other thing I'd like to add is that um, Sam showed the black bear example. And what we're able to do, because we collected that big multi-species data set, is we're going to be able to use this tool to assess genetic, genetic connectivity for multiple species. So we can select a, a snail, an amphibian, a forest carnivore, a bat, and species with different vegetability levels, and we'll be able to really pinpoint areas on the landscape that are important for many different species for connectivity, not just one species. Um, and that's a really key advantage. Um, if people are interested in, in learning more about MBI, you can go to the Fish and Game website, do a backslash, and just type in baseline, B-A-S-E-L-I-N-E, -E, and I will uh, turn it back over to Sam now. Thank you very much, Michael. I'd just like to you know, say one more time how Awesome it has been to collaborate with Michael, and particularly on this multi-species baseline initiative. It's been the biggest and most ambitious project I've worked on, and I've worked on lots of different things. Um, and the data set it has produced is unprecedented, and you know it's exciting as a researcher to get to to work on such things and and uh, apply these tools to it. So thanks, Michael, very much. So um, next slide, I'm going to be given really quickly because there's a not much time, uh, some examples of how we've used this model for other things. Uh, first one is uh, 
using CD Pop on American Martins in northern Idaho. There's a couple of papers, Wasserman et al., uh, to describe this in detail. Next slide. Uh, so what we did is we used landscape genetics to develop a resistance surface. This paper describes that. Um, and that resistance surface was then used in CD-POP to model landscape uh, connectivity and gene flow. Next slide. Uh, and we used that to simulate the effects of climate change on population connectivity uh, in the northern Rocky Mountains. Next slide. That shows you a change in the landscape we predict to be connected by dispersal in the current, which is 1,500 meter optimal elevation into about uh, the next century, 2100 is uh, t about 2,000 optimal elevation for Martin dispersal as the climate warms based on that first paper um, I showed you. And we can use these different resistance surfaces and, and uh, uh, distributions if we uh, assume that climate change affects the landscape as it is modeled here, we can then simulate how the landscape connectivity will change and use CDPOP to evaluate changes in genetic diversity. Next slide. So when we did that, uh, I'll focus on the graphs on the right, we used the CDPOP model to simulate changes in the population size and genetic diversity. In the as uh, the climate warming progresses in the simulation, 1,500 from the current at the left side of the x-axis to 2,000 meters at the right side, we have a decrease in heterozygosity of about almost 50% in this landscape and a decrease in allelic richness of over 50%. Um, so this is an example of how we can use this simulation model to not just say that the population might be affected by climate change, but we can then try to project quantitatively how it affects the genetic structure of the population and the genetic diversity. The next slide, uh, and we can use CDPOP also to look at the spatial pattern of that change. The previous bar chart shows you the change across the whole of the population. This map shows you the CDPOP output. Uh, every uh, colored cell is expected to be a place occupiable by Martins in each of the climate warming scenarios, B, C, D, E, and F are the future time steps after 2100, and you see fewer cells because as warming increases, Martins go up and off the mountain. Uh, as uh, suitable habitat gets higher up, there's less available. And then the color represents the loss of genetic diversity. Yellow is uh, roughly uh, no change, and then you get to this dark blue color in the far bottom right, it's like a 60 to 70 percent loss of genetic diversity. So it gives you a spatial pattern that's predicted change in the population and its genetic diversity. Uh, next slide. And then we could use that to predict uh, genetic diversity across a large area in the northern Rockies, 30 million hectares or so. Um, in each of these scenarios, red areas predicted to have high genetic diversity, blue areas predicted to have low genetic diversity, and again, the same scenarios, A being the current and F being 2100's expectations. And you see an area in northwest Montana and Idaho, that area in the corner, uh, expected to have a lot of reduction in genetic diversity because of fragmentation of connectivity and core habitat for climate change. The next slide goes to uh, our understanding of how it affects corridors and barriers. Uh, we can predict places that are always a corridor robust to connectivity, always a barrier, and things that go from being a, a corridor now to a barrier in the future. I'm going to move quickly along because there's a lot of examples, but next slide um, is what we're doing in Arizona on spotted owls and seed pop. And so we are using the seed pop model to test uh, and predict connectivity and genetic diversity of Mexican spotted owls. Uh, this example uses two different resistance models developed uh, from the habitat suitability modeling in two different parts of the southwest and compares how they're different and looks at two different dispersal distances so we can try to understand the sensitivity of connectivity predictions to uh, different models that are used and different dispersal abilities that are used. Next slide. So 
Um, what we show here is a high dispersal and low dispersal set scenarios, uh, looking at the isolation by distance slices by resistance on model A and model B. Long story short, we have uh, substantially different predictions of connectivity from the two different resistance models, model A and model B, but areas where they do agree. And the bottom part, we show predicted uh, genetic uh, distance as a function of uh, the resistance distance in the landscape, and we're now using this to look at the core areas and dispersal corridors that are robust and, and, and consistent between the two different models and the two different uh, dispersal abilities as a way to guide conservation of this threatened species. Uh, next slide. Uh, recently, I've collaborated with Aaron Langeth and uh, student with Oscar Soup, Western Washington University, to model population expansion of mountain goats in the Olympic Mountains, Washington State. So I'm sure most of you are aware, mountain goats were introduced in the early 20th century and increased to a peak population about 1980 when control started, and then there was a decrease in the population um, through management. So next slide is we were able to use CDPOP uh, to simulate that uh, range ex colonization and then the different removal scenarios to, divide, to see how uh, effective extirpation might be. So we first populated the range of suitable habitat in the mountains here and see all the places mountain goats might live. Next slide. And then ran CDPOP model uh, from the founder event and you see where these two dotted lines cross in this graph is the 1983 population estimate. It's about 55 years after the introduction. And the green curve is the CPOP simulation. So we were able to almost perfectly model the growth of that population um, and colonization with this model, which we need to verify if we're going to use the model to the model you know, management extirpation. We have to first show that the model works to model what actually happened in the population in the past, and then we can model it forward. So then the next slide is we were able to simulate removal. Uh, if we remove 80% of the females, you get this bottom line, which goes in more or less a stable population, slightly increasing after many years. But in the black triangles are the actual estimates. And they are estimating removing approximately that proportion of the population. And our simulation model shows that if you do remove that proportion of the population, you get that basic population trend. Not extirpation, but at least you uh, are able to control the population. So um, now they are working to use this to look at different removal scenarios uh, that can lead into an extinction <coughs> vortex to eradicate this indigenous species, which I believe is a goal of management. So next slide. We've also been using the CDPOP model for studying tiger conservation in central India, a paper just published on this in biological conservation recently. Next slide shows um, that paper. And on the right side, you see uh, a graph of colors uh, in a matrix on the x-axis are populations which correspond to the polygons in the map at the left and on the y-axis are scenarios different scenarios of landscape change uh, some augmenting the population through habitat protection or corridors and some reducing landscape connectivity to development and we can then model the change in extinction probability, with one red being high extinction probability for a population, blue being low. This way we can evaluate how realistic changes in the landscape affect the probability of local extinction in all these subpopulations of tigers. The so CDPOP being a spatially explicit individual based model is, uh, is a good tool for that kind of question. The next slide is doing a similar thing with lions in Africa. As tigers, there's been a very large reduction in the range and population of lions. Next slide. And so working with uh, the group here at Oxford, we're trying to understand population connectivity, gene flow, corridors, and barriers for lion movement. So in Africa, focusing on this 
Kavango Zambezi Conservation Area in uh, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Angola. So the next slide. And there are several parts of the project. Uh, first, we developed a landscape resistance model because there's no uh, the CEPOP model is based on cost distance between individuals. So you need a landscape resistance model to use it. So we used a telemetry-based uh, movement path analysis to understand landscape connectivity of lions. Uh, next slide shows the results of that. There are three demographic groups, adult females on the right, this adult males in the middle, dispersing juveniles on the left. They have different experiences of landscape resistance where they express different relationships to landscape patterns in their movement, females being very risk averse, avoiding going outside protected areas, uh, dispersing juveniles being much less risk averse, and this has big implications for how you model connectivity. The next slide. So now we are modeling uh, CD pop, uh, that population. Here is the distribution of the uh, population in the Kaza landscape, and we are running CD pop now to look at the scenarios, much like that tiger example. Um, work in progress. The next slide shows. Uh, another project that Zernetta was mentioning of clouded leopards in Borneo. Uh, I'm not going to get back into that much, but uh, she's testing 59 different scenarios of landscape change that are in the Saba development plan that they're implementing by 2033. And this gives a way to actually m quantify how planned landscape development will affect the uh, expected population distribution, abundance, genetic diversity of this uh, flagship species. So the next slide, um, Aaron Langeth is working with Seattle City Light on a number of projects related to dam relicensing to evaluate effects of dams on uh, native fish populations and their genetic connectivity and hybridization with non-native species um, and related topics. Uh, next slide. So you know, a bunch of management actions are planned if monitoring, habitat improvement, dam removal, non-native species suppression, reintroduction. So all of these things can be tested in advance with scenarios. You know, how will habitat improvement affect population genetics or population size? How will dam removal, how will native, non-native suppression? How many introductions and where to uh, it creates stable and growing populations of bull trout. So Aaron is leading that work, and it's uh, it's doing a bunch of different uh, scenarios, testing these different factors on fisheries. So the next slide. Um, also, we've done work with black bears, uh, looking at how the genetic structure of the black bears is related to female dispersal patterns and how variable is phylopatry of females uh, and uh, its relationship to population history, which um, was an interesting application looking at how the behavior and dispersal changes with the population history, the density and, and how long since recolonization a population is seems to change how bears move and disperse, which is like in that lion example, um, you know, getting dispersal right is a critical factor for connectivity kind of modeling, and it, and it is variable between demographic groups and also with different population history. So CDPOP is a nice tool to explore that. Next example. Is uh, looking at disease resistance and um, white bark pine and blister rust. Um, I didn't mention, but I will now. CD pop also simulates uh, adaptive evolution, not just gene flow or population dynamics. It simulates uh, evolution of adaptive genetic characteristics. And one of the examples that we've used it for is how we can uh, optimize scenarios for planting blister rust resistant white bark pine in the northern Rocky Mountains. Because as I'm sure you know, uh, blister rust has invaded the range of white bark pine in the northern Rockies and is having a major effect on the viability of white bark pines. But uh, one way to mitigate that 
is to uh, introduce or encourage uh, genetic variations that are resistant to oyster rust. The next slide shows simulations on this question. Uh, so the population size on this y-axis, time, some current on the x-axis, and we can simulate on the left that, um, how if having blister rust uh, has all mortality, this red line, or no mortality, um, the changes in the population. And then if a resistant gene is present and spreading through the population, what that does to the mortality curve. And so we can model um, how the evolution of the population of increasing rust resistance uh, can lead to a stabilized population out of the original extinction. And then we, um, that's as if it's planted into all zones. And this graph B, uh, so it's planting into all zones or planting in only some of the parts of the study area, because there are different parts of the study area that have to be management, um, you end up with lower white bark pine populations planting in some of these zones and then others. Uh, this is an example of how you could use a simulation model like this in an evolutionary context, in this case evolution of rust resistance and planting of rust resistant trees and spread of those trees through the population and how different spatial patterns of that management intervention can affect the species. So the next example, next slide, also is a disease spread modeling exercise, in this case for bighorn sheep, simulating the spread um, selection-driven genotypes uh, for a desert bighorn sheep. And the next slide shows how that works. You have different strengths of selection, which goes down vertically on the graph on the left, from no selection, weak, moderate, and strong at the bottom. And then year going along there. Um, and so that shows, you know, how the frequency of disease-resistant genes increased over time with selection strength and the distribution of the genes. And then the map on the right shows uh, for three different populations of desert bighorn sheep, the frequency of adaptive uh, selected <coughs> disease-resistant genes uh, in a population where first that gene was not present and was introduced or to uh, on the right, if that gene is already present in the population but at low frequency, um, and you get more and more frequent resistant genes in the pre-existing conditions and if it is just introduced to the population at one place and spreads. Uh, but it's an interesting application of how you can use kind of model to, to test how disease resistance spreads in a, in a population of ungulates. The next slide is near the end, because I want to give us time for our discussion. But the CDPOP model, uh, being an individual-based, spatially explicit population model, allows us to simulate population dynamics, gene flow, genetic diversity, and existing landscape conditions, and also to evaluate scenarios of climate change, disturbance, disease, management, development. And we can integrate this with other landscape ecology tools to develop analyses for adaptive management. I'll give you a quick example of that. The next slide is uh, another tool that um, I was involved in developing. Uh, this is the Rocky Mountain Landscape Simulator. The landscape Dynamics Simulation Model simulates disturbance and succession in a spatially explicit grid-based process. Um, and so you can simulate changes in uh, cover, edge, and composition of vegetation and feed into wildlife habitat suitability models or CDPOP. So, for example, next slide is we can use the RMLAND model on the right uh, to simulate disturbance and succession processes and produce predictions of the landscape composition, patch shape, frequency, severity, of disturbances and your impact on vegetation, feed that into CDPOP, which changes the landscape resistance and distribution of the population at the initial time, and we run that uh, with mating, dispersal, and selection, 
mortality, to simulate changes in population size, distribution, genotypes. This way we can couple you know, landscape dynamics models that project changes to the landscape to population and genetic model like CDPOP to look at scenarios um, that are in a more dynamic and realistic implementation than static snapshots. Like most examples I showed you here, you know, if this scenario happened or that scenario happened, here's a snapshot of the landscape. But the real landscapes are probably going to be dynamic, and so coupling the landscape model of population to a landscape model of landscape change dynamics is a useful way to do this. Um, so next slide. So how can you use CDPOP? It's, uh, it's a freely available software downloadable from the web. Uh, it's a Python-based program. It's pretty easy to use. It's uh, got a graphical user interface version or a command line version. Um, and the, the papers that I have shown here present parameterization that give you a good guide to how to use it. And for details, there's an extensive user manual. And better than that, uh, people like myself or Ern are eager to answer any questions if any of you or anyone else uh, wants to use it. So next slide. So just to wrap this up, and uh, so what we do at uh, the Center of Landscape Science is develop these kind of tools uh, to, to understand landscape dynamics and its effect on populations, distribution, genetic structure, diet adaptive management. And so uh, there are many tools that we've developed. CDPOP is one um, in, in landscape dynamic simulation modeling, like on lands and other, for egg stats, landscape pattern analysis, uh, Unicore landscape connectivity modeling, and some others. Um, so this talk today is about the CDPOP simulation context. Uh, and if there is interest, I'd love to talk about some of these other things that are really urgent and important now, such as the connectivity modeling software and its applications. But for now, um, next slide. That will be the end. And uh, the last 15 or 20 minutes, we can discuss uh, anything covered here or any of its other topic related to it that weren't covered. Great. Thank you very much, Sam, for that excellent presentation. Appreciate everyone uh, being on the line today. We have a really great audience. And I do have one question that actually came in in the comment box during the middle of Sam's presentation. So we can start with that particular question. It's has, uh, the question here is, have any of these models been verified with field data and how long would you have to wait to see if your assumptions were correct? Right. So yeah, very good question. Um, and the conference has been unmuted. The, the, there are a number of examples, including some that were presented here, where we first use a model to burn in the current situation, which means we simulate the past to get the present and then compare to the current. And we have found um, that it works pretty well if we get our parameters to match what we biologically expect to happen. We usually have been able to regenerate the actual parameters of the population pretty well in terms of distribution, abundances, genetic diversity of the local population. And we've also verified um, the model through simulation of what is expected. You know, population genetics and classic population dynamics have very nice mathematical expectations for ideal processes. So we were able to verify the model produces the rates of genetic differentiation or loss of genetic diversity we expect um, in population genetics and also population genetics we expect with a certain fecundity or, or mortality pattern and dispersal abilities. So both empirically and in, in the, the theoretical verification, the model, model works, uh, but getting the parameterization right biologically is always the hardest part, but the architecture and the process of the model are pretty robust, I believe. Thank you, Sam, for that answer. And just so everyone knows, uh, the lines are all live now. We've unmuted everyone. So 
if there's any extraneous background noise, we ask that you try to keep that to a minimum while we uh, continue with the Q&A. At this point, we'd like to, oh, we do have another question that came in here. Uh, is genetic information a primary requisite for the model? So there are two ways that people run this model. They either run it from an existing genetic structure of a known population, right? So let's say we have the species of concern and we know its genetic structure. We want to know how will it change in the future as these things happen. So then we basically initiate the real populations, population size distribution and genetic structure. Oftentimes we don't know that. And then we burn in the genetic structure that would be what the population would have given its distribution in the landscape resistance. And we just run it for a while until it equilibrates. So you can use the model without knowing the actual genetic structure of the population. And usually we do that because we usually don't know it. Um, like I said, when we run the verification and validation with the real data and theoretical expectation, we see that the model does do what it should do. So running that equilibration should uh, produce the results that are biologically meaningful. Um, but you can do it either way. Great. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, at this point, we've exhausted the questions in the comment box. So we do have some time remaining in our hour this afternoon. So at this point, we'd like to turn it over to a more traditional question and answer format. For those who have questions for Sam or his collaborators, uh, we ask that you state your name and your affiliation and then pose your question. Thank you very much. At this point, we'll open it up for general questions and answers. Thanks. Sam, this is Sandy from the uh, Sandy Boys from the Forest Service. On the hi, allele, Sandy. All right. hi, how you doing? On the allele frequency um, degradation through time, if I understand what you just said, was that you use conceptual loss in your simulation models versus empirical data? Is that correct? Um, what I meant was we do both depending on the situation. So. Theoretically, we expect in an ideal panmictic population for genetic diversity to be lost at a rate of 1 over 2 NE, but that is the effective population size. So we can use that to verify that the model is working correctly. Then we can add spatial structure and see how that changes if genetic diversity is lost more quickly in spatially structured populations. So we can see how the spatial process affects it and, and understand it, how it works, matches the theoretical expectations. And empirically, uh, we can look at the actual genetic structure of a population over time or in a snapshot and, and match what we see empirically with what the model is predicting and then that allows us to validate whether our model is a plausible um, process, right? If it doesn't produce the answer we know to be true, it's not working well, so it's a good way to validate. So just as a follow-up question, um, if you're, if you're looking at many populations, are you sampling the heterozygosity or allele frequency in each of the populations, and then, and then based on the size of the populations, then simulating through time what's going to happen? This is an individual-based model, which means we're not simulating populations, we're simulating individuals. So it tracks the location and movement and mating of each individual in the population and the genetic characteristics of each individual, right? Each individual has a particular heterozygosity and allelic diversity, and we can use that to look at patterns of heterozygosity, population diversity, and allelic diversity across the landscape. But it's not a land uh, population-based model, and I think that's one of its strengths. Population-based models assume a bunch of things that aren't usually true, such as discrete and um, often panmictic subpopulations or an individual-based spatial model does. Great. Thanks, Sam. Sam, we've got a question here that's come in through the comment box. Uh, this is one that I think will be relevant to a number of species and, and state programs. Are presence absence data on a species across a diverse landscape sufficient to adequately run a model of genetic connectivity and population persistence? 
So, yeah, that's a very good question. This model is based on three things. First, estimating the current distribution and density of the population and then understanding how the landscape affects movement, right? So that's the resistance part. But the first part is we have to have at least a good estimate of the size and distribution of the population. Now, the present absence data, the empirical data, it doesn't reflect that perfectly. So what we usually do is we use the empirical data that we have, perhaps in combination with uh, models of species uh, abundance or occurrence probability to populate the landscape with the potential locations that can be occupied. Essentially, the model wants to have what would be the, the, the carrying capacity of the landscape. So all the locations that could be occupied if the population were at carrying capacity as locations that the model can work on. Then the model simulates whether or not those are occupied and the genetic diversity of the individuals that are at those locations. So that's one of the challenges often is estimating what that carrying capacity would be in its distribution and density. But any spatial population model would require that we, we would know those or at least um, evaluate them. And what we often do is use sensitivity analysis. If we don't know what that number is, we can explore if it's a little higher or a little lower or something like that. Great, thank you. We've got another question that's come in here in the comment box. How do you model population growth with CDPOP? Does the model start with a set number of individuals on the landscape and juveniles can only first to cells that have become vacant because adults have died? Yeah, so there's this follows up the last one. So essentially what it does is it's a, a grid-based model. So you assign all the locations that represent places the animal could live. Let's call it the full carrying capacity if it were all habitats fully occupied. And then the model simulates changes in that population density distribution genetics over time as a function of differential mortality in different places, if some places have higher mortality risks than others, and then differential patterns of dispersal based on the landscape resistance and distribution. And that, you know, leads to spatial dynamics in the population distribution and abundance and also spatial patterns of genetic differentiation and genetic diversity. And there's ways that this model can be used with different mating systems, uh, you know, territorial adult animals, I mean, territorial uh, home range animals is the natural system for this type of model. Uh, but, you know, we're using it for pride-based systems like lions with some simple modifications, and it can be used for a, a bunch of other kinds of life histories as well. But it's, uh, you can't always ideally model everything with any model. And so more complicated mating systems or life histories um, are, are sometimes difficult to represent in any model, and this one too. Great. Thank you, Sam. We do have time for another question. If there's someone else on the line who has a question, now is your chance. Please give us your name and uh, your affiliation and state your question. Sam, this is Sandy Boyce again. Um, are you envisioning changes to the model that you're using? Yeah, we're always working on it. There's a bunch of changes that have been made already. The fish work is done in a version called CD Fish, which models this in a riverine network rather than a terrestrial landscape mosaic. There's a model called CD Metapop, which allows us to model much, much larger populations uh, by simulating them in an individual-based framework, but within the spatial neighborhoods that are treated as local populations. Um, and then there's something called CD Evolve, which is this uh, selection approach. There's all kinds of different innovations that are under development. One is uh, looking at epigenetic simulation, which is a hot topic in evolutionary biology now, how uh, non-genetic, but you know, rather gene modification, gene expression, affects evolution. 
Um, that's currently under development. Other mating systems and life histories um, for that are relevant for, for wildlife are underway as well. Um, so it's definitely a model that is growing and changing with our experience. Like I mentioned at the beginning, Aaron Lang at the University of Montana developed this and is, is the one keeping and deriving this change. And the nice thing about it is if there's any particular thing this model does not do that a particular researcher would like to do, Aaron usually has been able to work with them to customize it for that application. So many of the examples I showed you here, Aaron developed new versions of the model specifically for that particular application, which is which is a nice flexibility to have. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Sam. We have a couple more questions. We'll take these last two questions that came in in the comment box just now, and then we'll uh, wrap up today's webinar presentation. But for those of you who still have questions, please feel free to follow up directly with Sam, uh, either Monica Thomas or John Roethlisberger, whose emails are there. We'd be happy to put you in touch with him and follow up with any more detailed questions. But the first of the two questions is, does CDPOP perform well on species that exist naturally as metapopulations in discrete habitat units? And that answer to that is the version I just previously mentioned, CD Metapop is specifically designed for that. And uh, in fact, you can use the, the earlier version perfectly well um, because if you don't need the capacity to model large numbers of individuals, like thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions, uh, the, the original individual-based model allows you to look at metapopulation animals as well. Because metapopulations are basically just spatially structured populations that are connected by dispersal. We can model the distribution of potentially occupiable habitats in any way we like, including you know semi-discrete patches, and then model dispersal among them in this individual-based framework. So it, it seems to work perfectly well for those kinds of systems. Great, thank you. And our last question, can you model a small population at the start of the simulation and see if it grows under different landscape scenarios? Or do you have to start the simulation at carrying capacity? So the goat example I showed during my talk is exactly that. We started that with the actual number of individuals introduced in 1928, which is a couple of dozen, and then model that population growth and expansion and showed that we could get it to match uh, very closely the actual observed pattern of population growth and expansion. So you can start it um, at any point at equilibrium or less than equilibrium, model range expansion, population growth, population decline, different scenarios of that. Great. Thank you very much, Sam. Thanks to all the, those of you who uh, submitted questions. And again, if you have further questions for Sam, please feel free to follow up with him directly. Any of us involved in putting this webinar together would help be happy to help connect you. And thank you so much to Sam and colleagues for this excellent presentation today. We really appreciate your t taking the time to share this information with the AFWA audiences. And before I turn it over to my colleague, Dr. John Roethlisberger, for some closing remarks, I wanted to share the late breaking news that we are going to have another webinar coming up next month, Wednesday, March 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern Time with Megan Friggins on the topic of a vulnerability assessment tool to evaluate species response to environmental stressors, including climate change. This is a uh, presentation which we originally had scheduled in January but had to be rescheduled because of the government shutdown. So we're very much looking forward to that presentation will be on Wednesday, March 21st at 2 p.m. So watch for an announcement coming from uh, the, us at AFWA and from the Forest Service on that particular presentation and topic. And now I, for some closing remarks, I'd like to turn it over to our good friend and colleague, Dr. John Roethlisberger at U.S. Forest Service Research and Development. John. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, on behalf of the U.S. Forest Service Research and Development uh, Organization, uh, thank you to everyone who participated in the webinar today. Uh, special thanks to uh, Dr. Cushman for his presentation, and uh, especially to AFWA and Dr. Jonathan Mosley for uh, organizing and hosting this webinar. Uh, like Jonathan said, 
if anyone is interested in getting in touch uh, with Dr. Cushman uh, or with any Forest Service uh, scientist to talk about uh, opportunities for collaboration uh, or consultation, please feel free to reach out to me or to uh, my wildlife counterpart, uh, Monica Thomasy, or, or to Jonathan as well. Um, we really appreciate feedback about these webinars, uh, so please uh, feel free to get in touch with us with uh, any feedback that you may have. In particular, we're interested in suggestions for future uh, topics to feature uh, during this webinar series. series. So uh, please share those. Uh, and uh, with that, thank you to everyone. Uh, we look forward to uh, uh, joining with you again for the next webinar. Great. Thank you very much, John, and thank you all. This concludes today's webinar presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.